Good morning. My name is Mike, and I'm the pastor here at this church, and it is a blessing to have you join us. If you're new to the place, new to our church, if you've uh, walked into the building, would you do me a favor and take out your phone and zap that? Fill out the little form that comes up and let us know that you were here. Or if you want, just take out your bulletin, tear this off, fill that out. Throw that in the bucket at the end. Let us know that way. If you're watching online, just shoot us an email. Let us know that you're watching. I would appreciate that. Uh, I'll reach out to you this week and it'll be my opportunity to get to know you maybe a little better. Um, either way, I just love the opportunity to uh, connect with you some way. Speaking of connection, we're starting and doing a new series right now called Dot. It's about, it's kind of like the idea of dot to dot, and every dot matters. You matter, I matter, and together, um, we, God can do a lot. And I have a little saying in there, it's like, you know, one dot by itself, the dot's just a dot, but a dot connected to another dot can do a lot. And God wants to do a lot through our church, and you connecting to us and us connected to you uh, is a start of that. So I hope you'll be with us throughout this whole series, and maybe even call this church your home. God bless you. Thanks for being here. How are you? Good to see you. So we are um, finishing Dot's series today, actually. So uh, it's been a good time. We had a good time doing that. I had a little one, little little girl, give me a Dot to Dot book. Um, so I get to play Dot to Dots for uh, a while. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, it's great to see you. I hope you're going to have a, a great day. Um, the Word of God's awesome. It's neat how, how we're going to um, learn something about uh, even dot to dots in the scriptures, you're going to see later on uh, today. So it's pretty neat what, what the Lord laid on my heart, and I'm just real appreciative of what God did uh, in my life this week. You know, you're blessed with connections in this life. And I uh, recently um, lost a connection. Um, this lady that was a part of our life, my first church when I pastored, I was 27. And uh, my wife and I went, that's my wife right there, if you don't know. Um, but she, uh, she and I pastored, I pastored down, and, and we, her and I were there, um, but she went through it with me. And uh, we, we were down in Texas, and um, the, my best friend in the world, a 73-year-old man named Dan Boone, Daniel Boone. And, uh, he, and I lost him 10 years ago. We made it for his service, and his wife died 10 years to the day. Um, just this last week, and they asked me to be a part of the service via, via video, so I was, a, got, I was glad to do that, but um, I tell you, you meet these people in your life um, that come along in your life, and it's so grateful um, to have these people, and just re was a reminder uh, for her and I yesterday when we watched the service um, where God takes you in this life, and never take for granted where God puts you and places you, and for how long he places you and the connections that you're allowed to have there, because they might last a lot longer than you think. It's a blessing to be a part of a church. And just so you know, I am blessed, we are blessed to be connected in this place, and we are grateful for you. I just want you to know that. Um, every Sunday morning, we invite the men to come, men and boys, to come and pray here at the altar. We start our service with a men's prayer, and I invite the men to come and pray, and men and boys, if you'd like to join me here at the altar, if you're in the balcony, and just come to the front of the balcony, that'd be awesome. We like to start this way on Sunday morning, so I invite you to come out if you'd like to do that. <clears throat> awesome. Let's pray together. God, we come before you, and I thank you for these guys, and I ask you to bless them, God, and be, help them um, and myself to be the men uh, you've called us to be and to lead like you've called us to lead. And we just want to say thank you, Father, for um, just the privilege of um, this church and being in this church, and thank you for our families. Thank you for um, our wives and our kids, um, the influence that you've placed in our lives. And, um, God, I thank you for the same for e every person in this place. You put us all in positions of leadership. You put us in positions, God, where you've called us to, to be people who will do things for you uh, in this world. And I just pray we'd be attentive to that, see you at work in our life. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how alive it is and how pertinent it is and meets us where we're at. It's so amazing to me. Um, 
every single time I open your word, how, how you just speak to me. And I just praise you for that and thank you for it. And I thank you, God, for this church and the blessing that it is, the people that you make up this building and this place. I just pray that you would use these folks to show Jesus to this watching world, God, that we would be light in this city. I thank you for Melissa, who's leading worship today, and I ask you to bless her, use her in a mighty way today. As we sing praises to your name, as we lift up the name of Jesus, then may he be glorified and um, lifted up. And we lift him up and him only, and glorify you and you only. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. God bless you. It's good to see you. glad to be here. I was, um, wanted to share a little bit this weekend. I had a slight existential crisis last night, laying on the floor thinking, my life, I'm having a midlife crisis. This is happening. This is it. There's nothing left for me in this life. I've, I've gone past my prime, gone past um, all the opportunities and things like that. Isn't it amazing? The enemy just loves to kick you when you're down. Because not only that, we had porch pirates, and I lost my cute new Amazon purse. And I lost my hairspray, and it made me mad. And it just, it just got to me. I don't know why. That just got to me so rough. And I was laying on the floor last night after practicing, going, God, this is it. What else is there for me? My kids are growing up. I miss opportunities. I'm not as young as I used to be, all this kind of stuff. And this morning, I really had to pray that away. I don't know about you. I had to say, God, I was in a bad mood this morning. And I said, Lord, I need you to come in. I need you to speak to me. I need you to speak truth to me. And I started saying it out loud, like, no, wait a second. I'm not done. I'm, my dot is not disconnected from the grand plan that God has. It doesn't matter where I am. I am not disconnected. That has not shriveled away. There is more to me there. And the Lord led me to Psalm 18. And if you ever need something to really get you going, it's Psalm 18. It's, it's like getting ready to go into battle, getting ready to face the day, whatever you need there. And I just love, it just starts so strong. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And man, those things that beat you down, that hit you, what the enemy loves to say to you, just to disconnect you from God. That's his whole purpose. I'm going to disconnect you. I'm going to pull you out so you do not get to operate in the destiny and the calling that God has for you. And I had to fight that this week. And so part of, part of the way you fight that, you go against it, you speak truth, like Psalm, you read that, you let it wash over you, being washed by the word. And we're going to sing about it. We're just going to sing praises about God and who he is, what he's done, the strength. We're going to shout Hosanna and to praise him and say, I'm not going to believe those lies. I'm not disconnected. I'm not over. And I'm just going to believe that God as my salvation and my fortress and my stronghold is going to come through for me. So I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. Let's sing together. Jesus, he 
Hosanna. There's not another person in the history of the world that has ever had Hosanna or deserving of Hosanna. God, you are so good. Your mercy endures forever. God, I need your mercy. I need you to connect me to what is happening. God, we need your presence. Nothing else. I don't want the blessings. I don't want all the other benefits if I don't have the presence, Lord. We thank you that you are here today. You want to speak to everyone who's here. You want to be manifested through the word. You want to anoint the word that is going out. And God, we ask you for your presence to come in. Pray. 
the Spirit of God is mighty. The very presence changes. God, your very presence changes. It changes us. It changes the world. God, that you came down and dwelt among us. Just your presence coming in rocks things. And it changes things. And you are as our fortress and our stronghold. Because the whole world is going to respond to it, Lord. So we hang on to you. We sing, great are you, Lord, when nothing else is, can even compare to you. The whole world falling apart, yet my God, my rock and my fortress stands firm. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. We thank you that you have been faithful to us, Lord. We want to be faithful back to you in our gifts and our talents that you have given us. That we invest in the opportunities that you put before us, not just spiritually, but also physically, Lord. So we're going to give back to you. It's time for our tithes and offerings. I want to do something a little weird. I hope you can join me in it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our tithes and offerings. Come on, offer this up. One time that we get to actually give something back to the Lord. So there's different ways that we can do that. I'm so thankful there's different ways. We had the, the past, the, the bags. We had the bags with the handles when I was growing up. But we've evolved a little bit since then. We have the offerings in the bucket in the back. You can do so with bill pay, giving online, by text message. That's my personal favorite. I have tithes and offerings pinned to my contacts at the top of my text message. I can do it on my watch. Obviously not here today. Or you can give in person or by mail. How good that we can actually give something back to God. There ain't a whole lot that's good about us, except that Christ gave us our worth through the cross, and so we get to give this back to him. If you have been here before and I've had the pleasure to come and lead while Steve and Sandy are, are out doing some other things, I love hymns. I love bringing that. There's so much good theology packed in, in quite a few of them, and we're going to sing about the faithfulness of God and how he's been so faithful to us, and we get to be faithful back to him and what we give, faithful in our connections, too, where we're talking about God, the dots, where God has placed you, being faithful where God has placed you. So I'm looking forward to singing this grand old hymn of the faith with you, Great is Thy Faith.
thank you for your presence, your mercy, and your faithfulness. You may be seated. One year during harvest, my grip on the Sith seemed weak. The tips of my fingers numbed. First one finger, then the other. Within a short time, I could grip the tool, but scarcely feel it. By the end of the season, I felt nothing at all. The hand grasping the handle might as well have belonged to someone else. The feeling was gone. I said nothing to my wife, but I know she suspected something. How could she not? I carried my hand against my body like a wounded bird. One afternoon, I plunged my hand into a basin of water and just intending to wash my face. The water reddened. My finger was bleeding, really bleeding. I didn't even know I was wounded. How did I cut myself? On a knife? Did I slide it across the sharp edge of metal? I must have, but I didn't feel anything. It's on your clothes, too, my wife said softly. She was behind me. Before looking at her, I looked down at the crimson spots on my robe. For the longest time, I stood over the basin, just staring at my hand. Somehow I knew that my life was being forever altered. Shall I go with you to the priest, she said. No, I'll go alone. I turned and I looked into her moist eyes and standing next to her was her three-year-old little girl. I gazed into her face, but I couldn't say anything. What could I say? I stood and looked again at my wife. She touched my shoulder. With my good hand, I touched hers. It would be our final touch. Five years have passed. And no one has touched me since. The priest didn't touch me. He looked at my hand, now wrapped in a rag. He looked at my face, now shadowed in sorrow. I never really faulted him for what he said. He was only doing what he was instructed to do. He covered his mouth, extended his hand, palm forward, and said it, unclean. With one pronouncement, I lost my family, my farm, my future, and my friends. We're going to read about him in Mark chapter 1, 40. Through 45. We're finishing our series, Dots, today, and we're talking this morning about getting reconnected. When you've been disconnected, getting reconnected. First point this morning, a condition can disconnect me. A condition can disconnect me. And we saw that happen 
in the story I just read. But in Mark chapter 1, 40, we see what happened. Mark 1, 40, it says, A man with leprosy came to him. We are blessed to have the Bible and the recordings of the Bible and the books of the Bible. The first three books um, of the Bible, of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels. Those are um, called that because they're very similar. Um, they're very similar stories. You'll find a lot of the same stories in those books. But they're all a little different. Uh, it's kind of like looking at Pike's Peak from different angles. Same mountain, uh, just a different angle of the mountain. And uh, you'll read the same story. You can read the same story of this leper um, in all three of those Gospels. But you see a little bit of difference in each of them, a little nuance in all of them. Um, for instance, the Gospel of Matthew uh, tells us that this all happened just as Jesus was descending from the mountain side after he had preached the Sermon on the Mount, uh, his most famous sermon. Uh, Matthew 8, 1 through 2 says, When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him. So Matthew gives us the location, and then Luke, a physician, uh, gives us the man's condition. Look what Luke says. Luke 5, 12, a man came along who was covered in leprosy. That's important. Um, Luke 5, 12 in the King James says, behold, a man was full of leprosy. A man full of leprosy. New Living Translation translates that. Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. The point being that this man's disease was not recently diagnosed. It had progressed. Um, he had an advanced case. The condition had spread. His body was covered in disease. He would have uh, long ago, like Max Licato wrote, lost the feeling in his fingers and his toes, likely probably lost some of them. Uh, he was desperate and time for him was running out. And I also want you to notice something else. We are not told this man's name. We're not told who he was. None of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, none of them mention him by name. And that is noticeably significant in this particular story because up until this point, almost everyone that came to Jesus was mentioned by name. 24 of 25 people who had come to Jesus up to this point in the book of Luke were mentioned by name. Nevertheless, Luke tells us what this patient's condition was, but he doesn't tell us his name. And I think that's significant. The man was labeled. He was simply known as the man covered in leprosy. He was known by what he had. He was defined by his disease. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been labeled? Have you ever been defined by others? Have you ever been branded, judged, marginalized by the crowd? You know, there are a lot of labels out there. Matter of fact, I got a little label in your outline for a reason. So you can write down some of your labels. If you were to write down some of your labels that people have put on you, what would you write down there? There's lots of them. Single, divorced, widowed, ugly, fat, skinny, stupid, sick, addicted, convict, you name it. Whatever they've said, right? Whatever they have labeled you, whatever, however they have painted you, defined you. There's lots of labels out there. Most of us have been assigned or were assigned to read uh, in high school, at least back in my day, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's famous novel, The Scarlet Letter. Well, we had to read it. Didn't want to read it, <laughs> but we had to read it. The story of Hester Prynne. Hester Prynne, the Massachusetts Bay columnist who 
got pregnant out of wedlock. She was a stand-up girl, man. She wouldn't tell who got her pregnant, but she lived her entire life with that label, that label, that A for adultery on her body. She died without ever losing that label. And sometimes you think in your life, you're going to die without ever losing your label. You're always known for that thing. You're always known for that one thing you did. And let me tell you something. You put your own label on yourself. Sometimes you wear labels that Jesus has already taken off. He's already removed a label from your life, and yet you put it back on every day. That is not who you are. I, I looked, when I looked for the little sticker thing for that, for, to put it in the outline, I, every one of them said, my name is, and I hate that. I am not who you say I am. I am who Jesus says I am. And that's how I wish you would change that. So say, not that my name is, you say that is who I am. But maybe by the end of this message, you'll say, this is who Jesus says I am. It's a cruel world in which you live. This is a messed up world, man. And it's getting more and more messed up every single day. It's awful, awful what people say. It's awful how people treat us. We put people in a box. We define people. We do it too. We define people by what they are, what they've done in the past, what they look like. We limit people by the labels we put on them. Let me tell you something. We are not showing Christ to them when we only point out the worst in them. If all you see is the worst in somebody, you are not being Jesus to them. Because I tell you something, that is not what Jesus does in this story. The man we're talking about today is not in the New Testament because he was defined by his disease. He is in the New Testament because Jesus touched him. We don't know him because he stayed disconnected. We know him because he had a conversation that allowed him to be reconnected. And that's the second point. First point was a condition can disconnect me, but I want you to know something. A conversation can reconnect me. A conversation. Conversation can reconnect you. The rest of Mark 1, 40 through 42. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing you can make me clean. Verse 41. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he was cured. If you'd like to read all of what Max Licato wrote, it's in his book, Just Like Jesus. But let me pick up his story here. Before he spoke, he said, I knew he cared. Somehow I, I knew he hated the disease as much, no, no, more than I hated it. A flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew in front of faces. Children ducked behind parents. Unclean, they shouted. Again, I, I don't blame them. I was a huddled mass of death. But I scarcely heard them. I scarcely saw them. Their panic I'd seen a thousand times. His compassion, however, I had never beheld. Everyone stepped back except him. And he, he stepped forward toward me. Five years ago, my wife had stepped toward me 
She was the last to do so. Now he did. I didn't move. I just spoke. I said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Had he healed me with a word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with just speaking to me. He drew near me. He touched me. Five years ago, my wife had touched me. No one had touched me since until today. Energy flooded my body like water through a furrowed field. In an instant, in a moment, I felt warmth where there had been numbness. I I felt strength where there had been atrophy. My back straightened and my head lifted. He cupped his hands on my cheeks and he, he drew me so near I could feel the warmth of his breath and I could see the wetness in his eyes. I never forget, I'll never forget the one who dared to touch me. He could have healed me with a word. But he wanted to do more than heal me. He wanted to honor me, to validate me, to christen me. Imagine that. Unworthy of the touch of man, yet worthy of the touch of God. That crowd of thousands parted like the Red Sea when they saw him. Jesus' arms parted in a hug when he saw him. Here's the deal. Jesus is more contagious than anything that touches him. If you come to him with an illness, he doesn't catch it, he cures it. If you come to him with an addiction, he doesn't get hooked, he unhooks you. If you come to him with baggage, he doesn't get loaded down, he lifts your burden. That's how it works. Nothing meets him that isn't changed, and that includes you. Jesus is more contagious than anything we could ever bring to him and more compassionate than anyone we will ever meet. We may have um, thought we are labeled forever, but he rips those labels off and says, you're brand new. We may not have leprosy, but we all have something equally awful, and that's called sin. Sin and leprosy, by the way, have a lot in common. If you look at Isaiah 64, 6, you'll see what I mean. Look at Isaiah 64, 6. That scripture says, all of us have become like one who is, in, who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Your best day, the best you were ever in your life, the most sinless you were, the day, you know, when you got up and you're like, oh, I have not sinned today. I am perfect. Look at this day. I have done it, I am up, and then you go to the bathroom. (laughs) I mean, you just, that's about it, right? Because as soon as you you just start your day, you've already messed up, right? If you start your day, you say, I have not sinned, you just did. Because we're all sinners, we're all messed up. But your very best day, the holiest day you've ever had in your life, the day you were baptized, whatever day it is, your very best day, This word says is like a filthy rag. And that rag there is the rags that this leper was using. That's your best day. So your very best day is like a rag a leper would use. So guess what? You're dirty. And I'm dirty. I stole this from my wife's kitchen. 
This is a little thing we have on our counter that tells us if the dishes are dirty or clean. Right? Pretty cool. It's nice. Uh, you don't want to reach into the dishwasher if you see that. Right? Right? Go look in the cabinet. There's still some dishes there. Right? If there aren't any dishes in the cabinet, chances are they're in the dishwasher and they're clean. Right? Or I forgot to push the button <laughs> and they're not clean yet. Right? Uh, but dirty or clean. Right? Just tells you which they are. When they're this, when they're dirty, they've been used. Don't use them again till they're clean. And you know what? Sometimes in this life, that's what we feel like. Used. Can't be used again. Right? We're, 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 not, we're messed up. Right? We're, just, we're no good. And God's like, what? Let me clean you. And you can be used again. But you got to let them clean you. First thing you got to do is admit you're dirty. Admit you need cleaned. You need cleaned. You're not clean. You're dirty. For all have sinned. Let's look at that verse. Actually, let, let me, I'm jumping ahead. Look at, let's look at the combination or the, how sin and leprosy have some things in common. Let's just fly through this. Comparison. Both sin and leprosy begin within. Begin on the inside. Begins with a thought. When we don't think a thought captive, that thought becomes an action. That action leads to sin. Sin leads to death. We, it begins within. Number two, both sin and leprosy are painless at first. Both sin and leprosy, third, grow slowly. Both sin and leprosy numb the senses. You, eventually, you sin enough, you'll just become numb to it. You'll just do it so much, you'll just, you won't even think about it. When you first sin, once you've been clean for a while, you know that God is all over you. Holy Spirit conviction is all over you. You sin enough, you don't hear this voice very much. You can't feel the affected area. Next, both cause decay and deformity. Sin and leprosy both cause decay, both cause deformity. It'll mess you up. Both affect relationships. Your sin messes with you. It'll disconnect you. It'll disconnect you from your family. It'll disconnect you from your church. It'll disconnect you from your brothers and your sisters. It will. Here's an interesting factoid I found when studying for this message. Interesting little nugget. The Bible never speaks of healing leprosy, only cleansing it. Doesn't speak about healing it, just cleansing it. We're not yet healed of our sin nature either. We are just cleansed of it. We're cleansed of our sin. We still have a sin nature. We all have a proclivity to sin. We still have the ability to sin. We have a nature in us that fights. It's like a battle going on inside of us. We're all sinners. 1 John 1, 8. Here it is. Here's the dirty word. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, start the washing machine. Dishwash. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He'll cleanse you. He'll wash you. And you can be used again. So a condition can disconnect me. A conversation can reconnect me. And then the last one jumps up and bites you like a snake in the grass. A choice can disconnect others. This is where I was like, man, this series just, it's a good way to end this series on dots because this is truly what happens a lot of times. A choice, my choice can disconnect others. Mark 1, 43 through 45. 
Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Pretty clear. But verse 45 says, Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. <clears throat> the story began with a man that was disconnected. He comes to Jesus, he's cleansed, and he's reconnected. Because he immediately went out and was disobedient to Christ, his actions led to Jesus being more disconnected than he was before. I want you to think about something. Just as a side application in your life. Do your choices affect Jesus' ability to connect with other people? Do your choices, maybe you're like, they don't affect me at all. I'm happy with what he did to me, but you don't think about what they're doing to other people. Sometimes our choices affect his ability to connect with other people. You ever think of that? Nope, because we just think about ourselves. And that's an interesting aspect in the story. Our choices do not always directly affect us. That's the point. Our disobedience to Christ doesn't always show up in, the, in our life right away. And sometimes where we see it, Directly at all. Sometimes our choice to ignore what Jesus tells us to do hurts others. Worse, it hurts him. It directly affected him. He had to be in lonely places. It's easy, super easy here to justify his behavior, right? I mean, he just got healed. Give the dude a break, right? I... If you, I mean, if, if anybody should justify his disobedience, it's this dude, right? I mean, of course he went out and told everybody. He's been sick for five years or whatever. We don't know. Max Cato made that up. We don't know how long. But he's been sick, advanced leprosy a period of time. So he, he's been sick a long time. He's pumped. He's happy. But here's the deal. We do the same thing. We justify our disobedience. We dilute. We dilute disobedience. We, 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 uh, he probably didn't really mean that. There's a, there's a lot in this story here. Now, folks, I'm be, just being real with you. This is hard. It's hard to wrestle with, and I don't know what he means by everyone. Does he mean everyone? Did he mean you can't even go home to your wife and tell them? Did he mean that? You're like, well, of course he didn't mean that. What well, says that? Well, maybe they'll just catch him in town, and then they'll know. Maybe that's how they'll find I don't know. But the Bible does say in another place, if you don't leave your mother and father and brothers and sisters, you can't be my disciple. It does say that. That's another hard place. There's some hard words in the Bible, stuff we don't like. Jesus told him very specifically, very clearly here, don't tell anybody, and he told everybody. And here's the deal. Here's what we do. Jesus tells us to tell everybody, and we don't tell anybody. We're disobedient too. Huh. After Jesus touches us, our life ought to be a life of obedience to him. That's the point. And when it's not, it affects other people. It affects other people's ability to connect with him. 
It may, we may not agree with God, and doing what he says may not make sense to us, but it's always right, it's always right to listen to Jesus. It's always right to do what he says. It's never wrong to do what he says. And here's the other thing. There's, there's always a reason that Jesus asked us to do something just as there's always consequences for our disobedience. The guy in our story was oblivious to the cost of his disobedience. Still, his actions cost Jesus personally. Look again at verse 45. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Folks, This series, please hear this, it's not about us. This walk of ours, it's not about us. This church is not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us connecting for a greater good. Our obedience to Christ may directly impact others being able to be connected to Christ. So don't forget that. That's a point for us. Let's take some personal responsibility for this body. Let us take to heart that our actions can help or hurt the cause of Christ. That's the truth, because the Bible's the truth. Let's not pick and choose if we'll be obedient to God or not. Let's choose to be obedient to God every time. If we're disconnected, let's get reconnected. He's your source. If you're disconnected, if you're labeled, you put the label on yourself, you're, you're a sinner, you've done it again, write it down on your label. Ah, that's what I did. Again, that's your label. Here's the deal. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Today's about getting clean. All of us. If we're disconnected, let's get reconnected. If we're connected, let's stay connected. Amen? It's God's word. Let's do it. It's not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you very much for your word, and I thank you for I thank you for this story. I thank you for this man that you touched. And what a joy for him, God, to be given life again. For you to hug him and touch him. You didn't have to. We'd we'd already seen in your scriptures there that you could heal from a distance. And yet you touched him. You realized he needed a touch first. And I just thank you for that. And I know that you know the hearts and lives of everyone in this place, everyone watching online And I just pray that you would touch them where they live. That you would touch them like they need to be touched. Touch them in the place they need to be touched, God. Reach into their heart. Help them to see that you see them. That you know them. You know exactly what they need. I pray that you'll be real in someone's life today. I pray, God, that if any of us in this place have sin in our life, if we are dirty that we would choose to become clean today. Help us to realize that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to see our self, God, in reality, that our sins have separated us, have disconnected us, but that one conversation, one confession, makes us right again. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, God, shed on a cross for us that makes that possible. We praise you and we thank you for your word and we want to say, God, use us in this city to share others, share it with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Would you stand together? If you'd like to pray, Dustin and I will be here. We'd love the opportunity to pray. If your life needs to be cleansed, it's just a prayer away and this altar is open. God bless you.
alone are worthy, Lord. Thank you for this morning. Let your word wash over us and walk with us throughout the week until we come together again. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, thank you. Have a wonderful week.